Oh, hello everyone. I'm um, sorry for the delay. We, we experienced some technical difficulties. Um, thank you all the attendees for joining us today. My name is Luis Angel Martinez, a current graduate student at Yuan Shu's group at UCSD. And I have the honor to host today's speaker, Professor Stephanie Wright, uh, here present. As usual, before getting into our speaker's presentation, let me first bring to your attention the existence of the Polariton Chemistry Community Facebook page, where we encourage all researchers working on the Polariton Chemistry field to post their most recent contributions. We think that this will be a good place to start conversations around topics of interest for the community and to advertise open graduate positions and postdoc positions and the like. On the other hand, we have set up a YouTube channel where we post the recordings of webinars in case you want to catch up uh, with some of them. Be sure to subscribe to follow the latest, the latest uploads. Finally, as we usually do through how this webinar series, we encourage all participants to ask questions to the speaker anytime during the, during the, uh, the presentations. To do so, please, uh, just press the, the right hand button and I will notify, notify Professor Wright such that she can answer your, your inquiry. With that being said, um, let's move, move on to today's presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Stephanie Wright from Freie Universität Berlin. Uh, Professor Stephanie Wright holds the, the Chair of Experimental Solid State Physics at Freie Universität Berlin, Germany. After graduating from Technische Universität Berlin in Germany in 2001, she worked as a postdoc at the Materials Institute in Barcelona at the University and, and the University of Cambridge in the UK. Before taking up her current position, she was an, she was an assistant professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Stephanie works on the optical properties and light matter interaction in nanoscale materials. She is well known for her work on carbon-based nanostructures, such as carbon nanotubes and graphene. Stephanie initially got interested in metal nan nanostructures because she wanted to better understand surface enhanced Raman scattering. From there, she moved into nanoplasmonics as her second major research field. Stephanie published 200 research papers and won several awards for her work, including two grants by the European Research Council, ARC, where she's the she is the speaker of the nanoscale focus area at the Freie Universität and regular organizer of key conference in her field. Uh, with, that best, with that being said, I, I let the screen to Professor uh, Stephanie Wright. Yeah, Louis, thanks uh, very much for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Uh -huh. and start the presentation and get a nice laser pointer. Okay, so now uh, we are all set. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for the introduction and uh, thanks for inviting me to this, this webinar. I'm really curious how this works out. Um, I want to second Louise and encouraging you to ask questions during the presentation um, because in this webinar format, it's impossible to get feedback from the audience and find out whether you actually follow what I'm saying or not. Uh, so please don't be, uh, don't be shy and uh, interrupt me whenever necessary. Yeah, I want to introduce you to super crystals um, out of plasmonic gold nanoparticles that we started to synthesize um, some time ago. And we studied them uh, for their light matter coupling and found out that they are really in the extreme regimes of light matter interaction, uh, which is called the ultra strong and deep strong regime of light matter coupling. Um, and I want to present it as a way to study uh, the physics um, of this material, but also to show that they can act as hosts uh, for other systems like uh, nanostructures or molecules to, to provide um, a very special electromagnetic environment. Okay, the motivation, oh no, first let me introduce my uh, co-workers before I start um, talking about the science. Uh, so this is a collaboration between three places, um, my group at Freie Universität in Berlin. And here I want to mention um, in particular, Niklas Müller, 
um, who started this work as a PhD student. Um, he now finishes it as a postdoc and, and unfortunately will leave soon uh, to work at the University of Oxford. Then we have uh, the Universität Hamburg, um, also in Germany. It's about an hour and a half by train from Berlin. Um, and there Florian Schulz is a chemist who is really the driving person in the synthesis of the nanoparticles and the artificial crystals. Um, and then we have a very nice theory collaboration uh, with the university in, in Fortaleza in Brazil. So Eduardo Barros is a professor there and, and Bruno was a, graduate, a joint graduate student that visited us uh, for a year and a half. Okay, so the motivation uh, for this work was really um, that I started some time ago to ask myself, um, what kind of particles do we take into account when we try to predict materials properties? I'm mainly a person working with optical spectroscopy, um, so photoluminescence, absorption, transmission, um, and also Raman scattering and infrared absorption. So these are my experimental techniques. Um, but I also um, did a lot of theory calculations with semi-empirical and, and ab initio methods. And I always uh, found it strange that people say we, in order to calculate a piece of material uh, with an ab initio approach, we put everything that's inside our material, we put it into a, a black box, a solver, and then we solve um, Schrodinger's equation or whatever equation you want to take as a fundamental one for your system and get out the materials properties. And everything um, that makes out the material, where the ions and the electrons, and they were really put in, but um, the photons were never allowed to join. Yeah? So the photons were considered to be something that's external, that is an external perturbation um, to the material. Um, and I started to wonder why is that? So how do you distinguish between things that are considered to be essential to describe the properties of the material and things that are considered to be external. Okay, I guess most of you um, know the answer how you do this the distinction and why you can leave the photons out in the beginning. Um, the reason is that the interaction between materials and light is inherently weak. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's really just an external perturbation. And the language that we use to speak about light matter coupling goes like, um, I take a photon, I send it to my molecule or to my material, it absorbs the photon, and then an electron will be promoted from the ground state to the excited state, or from the conduction band to the valence band, or from the HOMO to the LUMO, uh, whatever the exact language is that you use, but this is the idea is you have a photon, you destroy it and use it um, to provide an excitation to the material. So this way of thinking is correct as long as light matter coupling that's um, indicated here with a, with a Rabi frequency is much smaller than the losses that you have in your system. Now, when you start increasing light matter interaction, you will get into the regime of strong light matter coupling, uh, where the Rabi frequency is larger um, than the losses that you provide. And what happens then is that the two states that you had in the beginning, the photon um, and the material state, they will mix and they will form um, a hybridized state, um, one that's slightly at lower energies, the lower polariton, and another one that's at higher energies, um, which is the upper polariton. And now once you're inside the material, it doesn't make any sense anymore to speak about the photon and the material, but you only have this hybridized state. It still makes a lot of sense to say that even then photons are something external that you can treat with perturbation theory uh, because for most excitations, the losses will be rather small compared to the total energy um, of the system that you consider. Um, so it's, it's, it's still valid to treat light as something external. But now let's keep going. Let's keep increasing this light matter coupling here. And what you reach then is a regime where you no longer compare um, the Rabi frequency with the losses that you have in your system, but you compare it to the bare frequency that you have in your system. And this one, if the uh, Rabi frequency comes kind of comparable, so same order of magnitude, um, then the bare frequency of your system, you call it the ultra strong regime of light matter coupling. Now, what happens in the ultra strong regime is that 
for every single um, combination of photon state and material excitation, you will have a band gap between the upper and the lower polariton. Yeah, so this here is called an electromagnetic stop band. And really, if you have a, a material that's in the ultra strong coupling regime and you try to send a photon at this energy here, it will not be able to penetrate your material. If you keep going, um, your Rabi frequency will eventually be bigger um, than the bare frequency, the uncoupled frequency of your material. And this is called the deep, strong regime of light matter interaction. And obviously, it doesn't make um, any sense anymore to say that the photons are an external perturbation to, the, to your material because light matter scuppling um, is on the same energy scale as the bare excitations that you have in your system. There are many strange things that have been predicted for uh, the deep, strong uh, coupling regime, for example, um, the ground state of your system will contain many virtual excitations. Um, and also there is a prediction that the electromagnetic field starts to avoid the matter. So you will have a decoupling um, of light and matter and many more exciting physical properties like that. Oops. Okay, so how, um, if, if you have this idea about light matter coupling and um, that it can be very strong, ultra strong, deep strong, which are the knobs that you need to turn um, in order to get into these different regimes. Um, the first knob that determine, determines the Rabi frequency is the oscillator strength of your material. And if you're able to change the oscillator strength, you will be able to change light matter coupling. Um, for that, I brought an example from the Rice group who looked at um, light matter interaction in films of carbon nanotubes. So carbon nanotube is one um, of my pet subjects. Um, and uh, so I was particularly excited to see this example. The thing about carbon nanotube is that they have a very strong oscillator strength if you polarize the incoming light along the nanotube axis. Yeah, so they very strongly absorb light. However, if you turn the polarization so that it is perpendicular to the tube, um, the oscillator strength becomes very weak and the nanotubes are essentially transparent. Now, what the people did in this experiment here is they took um, a film of single volt carbon nanotubes that were nicely um, aligned. And then um, they measured the dispersion of the exciton polaritons in the carbon nanotubes um, for the light polarized along the axis of the tube or the light polarized perpendicular to the nanotube axis. And you can see that when you polarize it along the nanotube axis, you clearly get um, a, a Ravi splitting um, into a lower polariton and an upper polaritonic branch. However, if the polarization is perpendicular to the tube, there is no such splittings present because the oscillator strength is so much smaller. The second knob that you can turn is um, the number of particles um, that you consider. So the Rabi frequency also scales with the square root with, of the number of with the square root of the number of particles. And here I want to discuss this example. Um, it comes from the Ebison group that looked um, at a particular combination of, of molecules, a molecular switch called spiropyran, that you can switch from this state, spiropyran with UV radiation into the myocyanine form. And if you do that, um, the optical absorption of the spiropyran that is basically zero in the visible will increase uh, very strongly for the myocyanine. You can actually see that in the experiment uh, so here's a vial with spiropyran, and then when you shine UV light onto it, it will turn purple because you get this absorption here around 650 uh, to 600 nanometers. Now what the experiment here does is um, that it starts from a cavity that is filled with some myrocyanine molecules. Yeah, so you see here the myrocyanine absorption, and then they irradiate um, this cavity with UV radiation. So the number of myrocyanine molecules keeps increasing because all the spiropyran switches into the myrocyanine state. So you add more and more molecules, which means that you increase um, the Rabi frequency of the system. And you can see that there is nicely a splitting into the lower and the upper polaritonic state. 
In order to go back from the merosyline to the spiropyran uh, state, you can either wait for some time um, or you can illuminate the merosyline with light in the visible. So if it absorbs here uh, with this visible radiation, it will switch back into the spiropyran state. And then the two upper and lower polariton will merge again because the number of merosyline molecules um, gets reduced and in the end you end up uh, with a single um, absorption line of the merosyline. The um, third knob that you can turn in order to um, increase the coupling strength is the volume is of the photons. Um, and there are um, in fact two ways in which people normally do that. One is you can take um, plasmonic particles that are able to focus the volume uh, that are able to focus electromagnetic fields into nanoscale volumes. And what you get then is a huge enhancement of the electromagnetic fields that will drive light matter coupling. Um, there's also the option to build a cavity. And this here is again shown for the case of the uh, merocyanine absorption um, that was measured here in a film that contains mer uh, merocyanine, but without the cavity. And then when you move to the cavity, you actually see the splitting into the upper and lower polariton. So how did people fare? I mean, with all the ideas how to increase light matter coupling, um, what did we actually get? So this here is an overview over many different experiments that started around, um, around 2000 and different systems that were used as experimental platform for achieving strong and ultra strong and deep strong light matter coupling. So early on, people focused a lot on inter subband polaritons. You see them here. Then as a chemistry community, you're probably most interested in the organic molecules. Um, they have on an absolute scale, they have a pretty high Rabi frequency on the order of uh, 100 uh, milli electron volt. Um, but their reduced coupling strength, so the ratio between the Rabi frequency and the bare frequency of the system is rather low. So they get into the ultra strong coupling regime, but they don't reach this deep st strong coupling regime that I introduced in the beginning. Um, two other platforms that are very popular are superconducting circuits and uh, Landau polaritons. They're particularly nice to study the physics of these systems. And as you can see, people um, even managed to drive them into the deep, strong regime of light matter interacting. But they have mainly two shortcomings. The first one is that the absolute value of the Rabi frequency is really low. So it's uh, micro EV or, or milli EV. So it's much lower than the thermal energy at room temperature, for example. Um, and also, I mean, you can only study these systems for themselves. You cannot fill them with molecules, for example. Um, to get ultra strong coupling um, to a molecular system. So what we uh, set out to do was to say, okay, let's um, find a way by using these two knobs that I described in the beginning, one and two, um, increasing the oscillator strength and increasing um, the number of systems that we are going to consider. Let's try to get a material that is in the regime of deep strong light matter coupling um, and hopefully also has a very large absolute coupling strengths. And if you look at the selection of things that are available here, you will see that uh, for many of the building blocks like organic molecules or um, uh, semiconducting quantum dots, if you look at um, the oscillator strengths for good representatives, so not the typical ones, but the ones that really interact strongly with light, you will see that the oscillator strength is on the order of one to 100. However, there is an entire different uh, class of materials which are plasmonic nanoparticles, which have huge oscillator strengths that are many orders of magnitude larger. And then on top of that, um, using this oscillator strength of 10 to the five, you can also take them and merge them into larger agglomerates uh, to make use of this idea that by increasing the number of particles that you consider, you can actually increase light matter coupling. So what are um, the optical excitations of these gold nanoparticles? What are our plasmons? Let me give a, um, a very brief introduction. So a plasmon is really an oscillation of free electrons that you have in a material. 
And um, how this oscillation comes about is kind of indicated here. Here you see um, a metal nanoparticle um, uh, inside the electric field of an electromagnetic wave. And at a given point in time, the, electromagnetic, the electric field is pointing upwards and you get a separation of these charges into slightly positive and, and slightly negative electron cloud. Now, when you wait uh, for some time, the electric field will have the reverse direction. So the charges are driven into the opposite direction and you repeat this over and over again. And you can imagine if you do it with the right frequency, you will get um, a resonance and it is called the localized surface plasmon resonance of this particular nanoparticle. You can calculate um, the frequency of this resonance. It depends on the number of um, free electrons that you have in your material and um, the dielectric constant of the environment and so on. And for um, typical nanoparticles that are made of gold, for example, this plasma frequency is going to be around 2.3 EV. So this is in the visible um, about uh, 600 nanometers, 550 nanometers, sorry. Um, you can change um, the energy or the frequency of this excitation, for example, by changing uh, the material. So this here is for silver. And then you see that the excitation, the plasmon excitation moves very much into the ultraviolet energy range. Or you can change it by changing the shape of your nanoparticle. So if you use a bar instead of a, of a round a spherical thing, it will move uh, to infrared, radiation, uh, infrared frequencies. So you can play around a lot with where these um, um, specific frequencies are situated, um, depending on the type of nanoparticle that you consider. And there's huge fields that deals with that. In addition to the dipole um, excitations that I discussed here, you also have higher order modes like quadrupole modes, hexapole modes, and um, maybe I'm going to say something about them at the very end of the presentation. Um, the thing that's really interesting for um, the nanoparticle crystal that I'm going to show is that the excitation of uh, such a plasmon will produce an electromagnetic near field at the surface and around the surface of the nanoparticle. So here you can see the intensity of the electric field um, of a gold nanoparticle normalized to the electric field that you send in. So the photon that you used um, to excite this plasmon and you can see that uh, there's a very strong enhancement up to a factor of 50, very close to the surface of the metal. And these electromagnetic fields, they provide a way for these plasmonic particles to interact with each other. So for example, if you bring two of them close together, they will get something like a hybridized mode where you get a very strong electromagnetic hotspots between these two nanoparticles. Um, um, and um, yeah, very strong hotspot between these two nanoparticles. And you can really uh, play around with this and construct um, different types of excitation very much like you do it um, for the, um, if, if you consider the electronic states of the hydrogen atom, for example. So this here is the one, the excitation with a very strong hotspot in the middle. It belongs to this particular excitation where you take two dipoles of two separated nanoparticles and you join them into an excitation that has a stronger dipole. Yeah, so both of them are pointing into the same direction. Um, you can also polarize the light perpendicular to the dimer direction then the dipole excitation will look like this. But there are also dark modes um, so, for example, this one here, where the two dipoles um, in the two disks look into opposite directions. So, if you look at the um, total dipole um, of this configuration here, you will see that it is zero. So, this excitation will not immediately interact um, with, with far field radiation. Now, people uh, realized that almost 20 years ago that you can talk and think about these plasmonic systems as if they are plasmonic molecules and that you can build more complex excitations, hexagons and, and so on and, and, and play around with your optical properties. Now, um, molecules are nice, but I, <laughs> I'm a condensed matter physicist. So I asked myself what happens if I take many 
um, of these nanoparticles. And instead of just putting them um, into plasmonic molecules, I put them into a plasmonic crystal. So this crystal here is supposed to be generated by many gold nanoparticles. So these are not gold atoms, but gold nanoparticles. Um, and then um, there's a theory of how to calculate the plasmonic excitations um, for such a crystal. If you look at the, um, at the gamma points, so these are the, the, the waves, uh, the plasmon excitations that will propagate through the crystal with an, with an infinite wavelength. You know, so um, the, the dipole strengths will be the same at every single um, nanoparticle. You can see that the single dipole that you had for the single nanoparticle that is here at one splits into two solutions one of them is a transverse solution. So um, the dipoles will be perpendicular to the propagation direction of your plasmon. And one of them is a longitudinal solution. And the transverse solution now can interact with electromagnetic radiation because light is in a transverse field as well. Now let's have a look at um, how this interaction actually works. And, um, what kind of excitations we will find. So here we start from the photon dispersion of the free photon. Yeah, so it's simply a line. Um, and then the line down here corresponds um, to the plasmon along the gamma L direction. This is the direction at which you look down here. And it's also the one that we are going to use later on in experiment. Now I have the two bare excitations and then I switch on light matter coupling and what I obtain um, are two solutions. One is a lower polariton and the other one is the upper polariton. And you can already see that between them, there's a giant splitting and a very high um, Rabi frequency. So we started to calculate the reduced coupling um, for this type of, of crystals. Um, so this is a plot of the Rabi frequency versus the original bare plasmon frequency of the uncoupled system as a function, as a function of the packing density um, that we have in, in our crystal. Um, and um, if you look at the, um, at the red data points and curve, this is a calculation we did for gold um, nanoparticle crystals um, using uh, finite um, time domain frequency domain um, simulations. And you can see that with a packing density that exceeds 0.7, we reach the regime of deep strong light matter coupling. So the Rabi frequency will be larger um, than the excitation energy of your material. So in order to get there, you really need to have large nanoparticles. So here are two examples. If you have nanoparticles with 50 nanometer diameter, um, and you let them have gaps between them of 20 nanometers, you will be here at this data point. And if you really want to get into this regime of deep strong light matter coupling, you need to have 50 nanometer diameter nanoparticles and pack them really closely with a gap of only two nanometers. And while there were many um, reports in the literature of artificial crystals made out of plasmonic nanoparticles like gold and silver, all of them had really no packing densities. Yeah. So people used, for example, DNA um, to assemble um, crystals out of, of gold nanoparticles, but then the distance um, between the gold nanoparticles was in fact much larger than their diameter. So Professor, the question is, right? yes? Yeah, we, we have a question from the audience. Yeah. Oh, hello. Uh, I have a question regarding your left figure. Um, when I look at just a regular plasmonic metal like silver, and I look at the surface plasmon and as well as the upper branch, I mean, I get a very similar, uh, very similar dispersion curves as the left hand side. Um, how do your nano uh, how, how do your plasmonic crystals, um, those Rabi splittings compare with just a plain old um, metal film, like sil silver metal film and the surface plasmons on the, on the upper branch associated to them? Yeah, yeah. so the, um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. In fact, it is um, the, um, 
the, the, the bulk metal will be the, in the theory, it will be the ultimate limit of packing density. So the, the one here, because it was calculated for FCC, in fact, corresponds to 74% uh, packing density. If you, if you really fill the entire volume that's available, um, you end up um, with a bulk uh, metal crystal. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And then you still will have um, the upper solution. It corresponds, in fact, to the um, longitudinal excitation, so, so to the um, plasmon that you have in, in bulk materials. Um, and if you want to see it, if you want to excite it, you need to go to a surface uh, plasmon polariton. However, what you won't have, and what I think is the interesting part, is the lower polariton because this one will go all the way down to zero. So there in, in a metal, there are really no restoring, I mean, there is no transverse solution uh, for plasmons because there are no restoring forces for transverse movement of the electrons. So what happens is that um, the stop end here, which is shown in, in gray, it extends all the way down to zero. And essentially you will not be able to enter the crystal with the light and you will not be able to excite um, the polaritons. Wait, so are you saying, okay, because I mean, with a regular uh, metal film, uh, I also have a huge stop band, uh, co correct yes. me if I'm wrong. Yeah, but, but you don't have the lower polariton. Uh, in the sense that I don't, I cannot have, um, what, what do you mean by that? I mean, I would say the surface plasmon dispersion is the lower polariton in that case. Is that not true? No, this is a three-dimensional, um, this is the three-dimensional problem. Uh -huh. So this is, a, this is really propagating. The reason why you get this lower polariton is because all the electrons are localized on the nanoparticles. I see. So, so you get a collective propagation through the crystal, but the electrons are in fact not allowed to move. Yeah? They are bound to the nanoparticles. I see. I see, and then you can excite them directly in this problem? Yes. The lower? Okay, yeah. okay, I see. So that you. will come because now we go to the theory, uh, to the experiments part. Uh, so the first um, challenge was to synthesize these, these crystals. Um, and um, for that, um, two things are important. First, the nanoparticles have to be really large and they also have to be really uniform. Um, and essentially, this was a, a tour de force for doing a very careful optimization of the standard nanoparticle synthesis that exists. And uh, to find new ligands um, that are able to stabilize larger nanoparticles. So most of the ligands that are used together with gold nanoparticles up to now um, mainly stabilize uh, nanoparticles below 10 nanometers or up to 10 nanometers. Um, and what Florian Schulz did here was to use this uh, polystyrene ligand that allow him to go to nanoparticle sizes of 50 nanometer or to now he also went up to 80 nanometers. And then he introduced a process uh, where he always, um, where he used gold nanoparticles as seeds to grow larger gold nanoparticles and he kind of stopped the growth process repeatedly and all that led um, to the synthesis of these really very homogeneous um, gold nanoparticles that all have essentially the same diameter. Um, and the reason why they appear in different colors here in this TEM image is that they're single crystals and you can actually get um, a, a different contrast by the way in which exactly the single crystal is, is oriented. Um, the polystyrene ligands um, um, enforce um, an hexagonal um, order onto these gold nanoparticles. And here's a very large monolayer where you can see that they're all beautifully packed in a hexagonal close packed fashion. And then um, he um, started to synthesize um, gold nanoparticle supercrystals at a liquid-liquid interface. This is essentially a, a process that has been known. Um, so you take one liquid, you put a second liquid, they don't mix. So you put a second liquid containing the gold nanoparticles on top. You cover the entire thing so that the upper liquid evaporates really slowly. And then you wait for about a day. And at the end, you get these crystals um, that formed here and that are now floating on the liquid and you can fish them out um, with a substrate. 
And here are examples. So this was a monolayer. Here's an example of a bilayer. Um, you can see that you get these kind of moray structures, which is which arises because the, the bilayers, the two layers, are slightly tilted um, against each other. And here's the um, the R3 layers, and you can keep going. Um, and this here is now an image of a crystal in a um, scattering electron microscope, and we look at the edge um, of a single crystal. And if we zoom in um, further, you very nicely see the two FCC faces um, of um, this particular gold nanoparticle crystal that had 60 nanometers in diameter for the, for the particles themselves. Now, in order to look at the optical properties, um, we very straightforwardly uh, measured the transmission and um, reflectance of these films of gold nanoparticles. So this here is a setup where you have two uh, microscope of ob objectives and you either can look at the transmitted light or you can look at the reflected light. And if you do that, um, so here are optical images of a monolayer, two layers and three layers, you will see that you get such kinks um, in the transmission, uh, in the reflection, um, and also corresponding features in the transmission and the absorption that you can calculate from that looks like this. If you have a single monolayer, it's essentially featureless. And then for a bilayer, you get one peak. For a trilayer, you get two peaks. For four layers, you get four peaks and so on. And what they correspond to are in fact standing waves of the um, polaritons inside your gold films and um, you have an open cavity boundary condition so you only have certain um, polaritonic wavelengths that are compatible with the thickness of your crystal. So the first one is typically one where half a wavelength uh, matches the thickness of the crystal and then the second one is where a full wavelength matches and so forth. And now the nice thing about um, these samples is that we discovered many places where they looked very terrace-like. Yeah? So this here is an SEM image. You have a certain number of layers here, then a new layer starts, the next layer starts, and so forth. And if you look at such a sample um, in a dark field optical microscope, it, it looks like this here. Um, so the dark areas is where you have a closed or, or a constant number of layers. And then as soon when a new layer starts, you see this here as a, as a bright line. Um, and by this, we were able to go from, I think this year starts with four layers, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and so on all the way up to 40 layers um, and counting them and knowing how many exactly we had. So if you look at the reflectance, for example, of such a, a nanoparticle crystal as a function of layer numbers, um, it looks like this. Um, you have um, an area where you have a very high reflectance, and this corresponds to the polaritonic stop band, so to the gap between the lower and the upper polariton. Then above 2.3 uh, EV, you get the intraband transitions of, of gold. So here the light will be simply um, absorbed by the gold. If this was silver, the polaritonic stop band would extend much further. And below the stop band, you have these fan-like um, structures and they come uh, from the different uh, solutions to your open cavity boundary conditions. Um, and they will move when you change the number of layers um, because, because you slightly change the boundary conditions. Yeah? So you change the, the, the wavelengths of, um, of the polariton that, that is able to transmit through your crystal, uh, of the photon that is able to transmit through your crystal. Okay, you can evaluate this. You know the polariton wavelengths um, from the boundary condition and from the thickness of the crystal. Therefore, it was so important that we are able to count the number of layers. And you can read off um, the frequencies that they have um, from, the, um, from, from the optical spectra. And um, if we do this and if we plot um, the frequency as a function of the wavelength or of the wave vector, we get plots like that. And uh, this is a dispersion now of the lower polariton. And if we fit it um, with, a, with the Hopfield Hamiltonian, it essentially describes um, exactly the physics of this system. We are able um, 
to extract the, the absolute value of the Rabi frequency, which is between two and three EV, um, and also the reduced coupling strength, which starts just below one. So this here is still ultra strong, not deep strong, and then goes very high into the deep strong coupling regime. Okay, and I showed you this plot before. This was what everybody else had been doing. And now we are up here. Um, so we are record high in the coupling strengths, um, both in the reduced coupling, but also um, in the absolute values that we get for the Rabi frequencies. Now let's look at some of the consequences. Can, can somebody tell me how I'm doing time-wise? I have no watch here, I just realized. Oh yeah, um, we have a uh, fifth. No, to, uh, 20, 20 minutes. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so let's let's look at some of the um, uh, some of the phenomena that we can um, that we can see for this plasma polariton. So um, the first one is to examine the Hamiltonian um, that describes our system. So this here is a full Hamiltonian um that contains a number of uh, creation annihilation operators both for the photons and for the plasmons um, and then we have an interaction operator and the so-called diamagnetic or a square term that essentially describes the uh, self energy of the photons in in our system and normally when people deal with light matter interactions they will drop a number of terms um, in this Hamiltonian in order to make um, calculations more feasible. So for example, they would typically um, neglect this A squared term here. And what you arrive on then is a so-called Dicker model. Um, and here is a, um, here, here are the experimental data points for one uh, particular crystal where we measured the lower polariton. And this is a fit with a full Hopfield Hamiltonian and this is given here. And now when I go to the Dicker model, you will see that the dispersion changes very much. And in fact, the entire system becomes unstable. Um, you can also, if you look at the interaction Hamiltonian, um, there are some um, combinations of creation or annihilation operators where you at the same time either create um, two excitations. So you create a photon and a plasmon at the same time, or you destroy them at the same time. And these are so-called counter-rotating contributions that are also normally um, neglected. And if you take out the counter-rotating term, you get the orange um, line here. So again, it is not able to describe the experimental data. And even if we fit again um, with free, totally free parameters, we are not able um, to reproduce the dispersion that we see experimentally. And finally, then there is a um, most common approximation, namely the rotating wave approximation, which means that you drop both of these terms and then um, you arrive at the, at the blue curve here. Okay, so we can see that, um, I mean, we, we need these higher order terms in the interaction Hamiltonian um, in order to describe our system, but can we also see some um, other signatures of the um, a, a deep strong regime of light matter interaction. And okay. one of the most counterintuitive predictions that people have made about this regime is that you will actually get a decoupling of the light and matter degrees of freedom. And how mm -hmm. that happens, um, I want to give you um, a brief introduction. Um, you can also write down your Hamiltonian here in such a way, I mean, instead of um, formulating it in terms of photons and plasmons, you can also write it down in the form of polaritons. Um, and now this kind of immediately encompasses the entire um, polariton dispersion. Uh, and if you do that, then every polariton has some contributions that were originally photons, so to speak, and some contributions that are meta-like. Yeah, so these are plasmons um, in this particular example. Professor, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. And we have a question from the audience. Um, hi, uh, perhaps it's a naive question, but do you have or do, or do you account in the Hamiltonian for the non-radiative decay of the plasmonic excitation and does it, do, will this have an influence uh, on what you're showing now? 
Sorry, I didn't get your question. Can you say it again? Yeah. Um, do you or do you have to account for the non-radiative decays of the plasmonic excitation? I mean, the, the conversion of the um, electronic motion in the plasmons into um, into vibrational motion, I mean. Convert, yeah. Well, the, the plasmons are kind of described as something, um, it, it depends which part you mean. So in the, in the microscopic model in the beginning, um, everything is calculated within the point dipole approximation. So a plasmon is just a dipole that's sitting in the center of the nanoparticle. Um, and that it is actually um, involves the motions of electrons is something that we don't consider. I mean, we don't go so deep into the microscopic origin, but just treat the plasmon as a quasi particle. Right, right. But the plasmons have a, <clears throat> a very short lifetime, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's not only due to the to the radiative part of the um, of, of the decay. The, uh, do, do you account for any of that there even even uh, empirically or, or phenomenologically or not at all? I mean, the thing, um, so, so I'm, I'm going to, to show a little bit about um, lifetimes later on. I mean, the thing um, um, about Lifetime. So, I mean, the lifetime or the, the the decay of the plasmons is, of course, taken into into account in the FTTD calculations that we do. Yeah? Um, it is not explicitly included in the point dipole approximation, only added um, later on as a lifetime of the system. Um, but there is a um, uh, there was a paper that asked the question whether the finite lifetime is actually going to affect light matter interaction. And the answer was that at the end of the day, it doesn't. So it adds a dissipative channel, uh, but uh, for example, the system will remain in the ultra strong or deep strong regime. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm not sure whether I answered your question, but I um, still haven't understood I mean, it I, 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 I would be interested to, uh, if you could send me perhaps the reference of this paper, I would be, I would yeah, be interested yeah. to read it. Yeah, yeah, um, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so, um, now let's look at how metal-like or how um, plasmon-like the lower polariton branch is. Yeah, So we focus here on the lower branch. Everything will be exactly reversed for the upper branch. Um, if you're initially in the, I mean, strong coupling regime, but rather a weak coupling regime, um, the lower branch will start off to be photon-like. Yeah, so you, you can see that it has a dispersion of a photon. And then after the level anti-crossing between the photon and the matter, it will become um, almost 100% plasmonic. Now, um, if you increase light matter interaction, um, the, there will be an additional uh, mixing hybridization between the photonic and uh, the plasmonic uh, parts is, is the essence um, of, the, of the strong regime of light matter interaction. So in the beginning, um, the branch will no longer be 100% photonic, but it will only be 80% photonic and roughly 20 or 30% plasmonic. Um, and uh, yeah, then after the level anti-crossing, it will again switch character. But if you keep going, um, you will reach a point, namely where an eta is equal to one half, where there is no longer a crossing um, between the plasmonic and the uh, photonic type. Um, of your, um, of your branch. So the lower branch will set out in the beginning to be 50% plasmonic. And while you go along the dispersion, it will only increase until its plasmonic character goes up to 100, almost 100% 100 at the end. And if I go into the deep strong regime, so if I make eta equal to one, you can see um, that it is almost only plasmonic um, and only a very little, or only very small photonic contribution. And this is what was called um, the decoupling of light and matter. It means you start from two decoupled states, the photon and uh, the plasmon, and then you switch on light matter coupling, you make it stronger and stronger and stronger. So they will couple, but in the end they will decouple again, but of course have a much different dispersion from what they had in the beginning. Now, an interesting consequence of this decoupling of light and matter is um, that the Purcell effect uh, will vanish. So the Purcell effect, as I'm, I'm sure you know, tells you that the um, radiative decay rate um, is related to light matter, to the 
um, reduced coupling strengths of light matter interaction squared. This is shown here on a, on a log log plot. So this uh, dependence is a straight line. Um, and uh, this dashed line here actually corresponds um, to this equation. You can see that for small eta, it very well um, describes um, the relation between the uh, radiative damping and the coupling strengths. So here's one of the hallmark experiments that shows the Purcell effect. Um, it has uh, looked at quantum dots and light emission from quantum dots with time resolved spectroscopy. And then when you're able to increase light matter coupling, it was done with a cavity and the quantum dots placed in a cavity, you see um, that the lifetime goes down. So the radiative rate goes up. And on the other hand, if you reduce light matter coupling, then the lifetime goes up or the radiative rate goes down. However, if you keep um, increasing light matter coupling and get into the ultra strong regime, the Purcell effect will first saturate and then it will actually um, go down if you reach deep strong light matter coupling. And this was a prediction that had been made a couple of years ago. And in order to test it, we looked um, at one um, of the polariton peaks um, in the gold nanoparticle crystals. And they were selected in such a way that the thickness of the crystals was identical. So the boundary conditions are identical, but um, the coupling strength is different. And therefore also the position of these peaks is different. And what you can see is that with increasing light matter coupling, the peak becomes stronger, but it also becomes narrower. And you can uh, kind of subtract out the non-radiative contribution and just look at the radiative part. And if you do that, and put it um, onto this uh, prediction for the breakdown of the Purcell effect, we see that there's a very nice um, overall agreement. Okay, so this was one uh, first example for the physics that people expect um, in the regime um, of deep strong light matter interaction. Um, now I want to look at something else, namely enhanced spectroscopy using these gold uh, nanoparticle crystals or to kind of use these nanoparticle crystals as a, as a host system uh, for molecules inside. Uh, professor? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we have one more question from the audience. Yes, yeah. Oh, hello. Uh, I have a question. So are you claiming that the decoupling between light and matter in the deep strong coupling regime, uh, I can, it comes out naturally from the Hopfield Hamiltonian alone? Uh, is that uh, the statement uh, from uh, one slide before? Um, the decoupling of light and matter, yeah. It comes out of the Hopfield Hamiltonian. You can also derive it uh, classically. So It's not a quantum okay. effect. Yeah, It essentially comes out of the A square term. Mm -hmm. um, it, is, it, is, it comes out of the A square term. If, if, you, if you formulate it within the Hopfield Hamiltonian, it comes out of the A square term. What happens... Um, Let's see, I don't took it out of the presentation, but we can see it here. Um, if you think about the electric fields and these gold nanoparticles, there's a very large dielectric contrast between the two. So the electric field gets squeezed into these cavities between the gold nanoparticles. And, and this very much concentrates um, the electric fields and strongly increases um, the contribution of the A square term. And that, in fact, rearranges um, the electromagnetic field inside the gold nanoparticles so that the, the light avoids, um, um, avoids the, the places of the dipoles. Avoids the what of the dipoles, sorry? It avoids the place of the dipoles. If you, if you just look at um, how the electric fields are distributed, um, it, it, I mean, this was an... In the very beginning, this was the image that in the original paper was shown. Um, it kind of tried to make a hand waving explanation of what happens. So this here is supposed to be a cavity mm -hmm. um, with a dipole in it. And mm -hmm. if you look at the distribution of the electric field inside this cavity, if you reach the deep strong regime, it you, you will see that the electric field tries to, to get away from the place where the dipole is, is situated. I see. But then in terms of if you were going to do things for enhanced spectroscopy, so uh, would it make sense to actually, 
I mean, at the expense of the electromagnetic field uh, avoiding the dipole, would it, I assume it, it actually accumulates uh, outside of the dipole. So then- Yes, it accumulates uh, between the nanoparticles. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, okay. But then can you use that to your advantage for anything? Yes, that's what we are trying to do. Okay. Um, so, yes, and so this is now for, for the enhanced spectroscopy. Uh, so we looked at two flavors of the enhanced spectroscopy, namely surface enhanced spectroscopies using these near fields of the polaritons and CERAS, uh, surface enhanced infrared um, absorption spectroscopy. Um, so the idea for both of these type spectroscopies um, is, um, I mean, forget about why they are called surface enhanced. Essentially what you do is you put um, a probe, say a molecule, into a place where the electric field is very much enhanced. So where there's a very high density um, for, the, for the electric field. And that will increase, I lost my pointer. Um, that will increase um, both the Raman effect, um, because essentially you're driving the Raman effect uh, with a higher intensity, um, but also the scattered light, it will also be enhanced. And it will also enhance infrared absorption. Here you can really directly understand it because the electric field is, is just going to be much stronger um, at the places of these hotspots. So we said, okay, let's, let's have a look at that. And uh, first, let's have a look at um, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. Um, so here is, again, a very brief view graph summarizing how surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy works. So the normal Raman effect is um, that um, you have your molecule um, in the ground state, in the electronic ground state, and then um, you excite it uh, with a laser it goes up into an intermediate state that is often called a virtual state um, and falls back not onto the ground state, but into the vibrationally excited state. Um, and if it goes like that, if it starts from the vibrational ground state, goes up into an excited state, you have Stokes Raman scattering, and I'm not going to talk about the other two. Now, what happens if I take this molecule and instead, um, of exciting it with a, with a laser coming from the far field, um, I use something that provides a very strong electromagnetic near field for the enhancement. Um, then um, the incoming radiation will be enhanced um, by this enhancement factor to the power of two. Um, but also the outgoing Raman scattered light will experience essentially the same enhancement, but at a different frequency so that um, the intensity of surface enhanced Raman scattering is given by the Raman intensity of the system times um, the enhancement of the electromagnetic field that you produced to the power of four. And okay, so then um, we looked at surface enhanced Raman scattering from these gold nanoparticle crystals. So here's a Raman film um, of bulk polystyrene and then when we looked um, at the Raman intensity of a monolayer um, of the gold nanoparticles, where we essentially have cannot excite um, any polaritons, um, we get the same Raman intensity. But then when we focus onto a double layer of our material, you can see that there is a strong increase um, in the Raman intensity. And you can very nicely correlate that we used uh, tunable laser excitations. So here is a um, measurement of the reflectance and you see the reflectant dip that comes um, from the standing polariton wave here. So this means that now we have the enhanced fields inside. Um, and if you um, measure enhanced Raman scattering, you can see that it kind of follows the, the, the enhancement, uh, follows the same dependence as this dip here. And in fact, uh, you can find out uh, that you have both an enhancement of the incoming um, or the Raman scattered light and, and both of them can be traced back here to the excitation of the polariton. You can also go to three layers, then the um, reflection dip will be at slightly um, different um, frequency um, and also the, um, the, Raman, the enhanced Raman scattering um, will change accordingly. 
Now, if you look um, at the enhancement factors here at the site, um, you see that they're on the order of 300 um, or maybe, yeah, 300, um, which is, if you know about service enhanced Raman scattering, not particularly high. Um, so people in enhanced Raman scattering, they are used to many more orders of magnitude enhancement, something like 10 to the five, 10 to the six even, and even higher. Um, and the reason why we get rather weak enhancement is, is twofold. The, the first one, we here report a kind of an average enhancement. So we do not only consider the molecules that are actually sitting in these polaritonic hotspots, but um, the, the Raman probes that we use are the polystyrene molecules of the gold nanoparticles. So they're essentially everywhere around the gold nanoparticles. And this also includes places where the electromagnetic field is not particularly strong. That's the first reason. The second reason is really more fundamental in nature and um, cannot be overcome. Um, if you do the experiment like shown here, if you have a dimer of gold nanoparticles um, and use them to um, enhance Raman scattering by a molecule in the cavity, what you do is you collect an electromagnetic field that is much larger than your dimer and focus everything into the tiny hotspot in the middle. Yeah, so, so your molecule here, your surface enhanced molecule can really harvest um, the entire electromagnetic radiation um, that's, that's coming on a much larger area than, than the geometric size of the dimer. However, if you go um, for a closed pack um, system of gold nanoparticles, as we did in our experiment, there will be the next hotspot right next to the first one. And then there's another hotspot coming and so on. So you cannot really concentrate light from a very large volume down um, into a very small cavity, but you can also only take the light that is kind of coming um, from this area here um, that corresponds to the diameter of a nanoparticle itself. So the downside is that um, uh, fundamentally, surface enhanced Raman scattering is never going to be really strong uh, for these materials. On the other hand, it's going to be very reproducible. Um, and this here is a, a waterfall plot that scans um, over the surface of such a crystal. And we start from a place where we have a monolayer, so Raman scattering is very weak. Um, and then the laser went over one of these steps where you go up um, to a bilayer. Um, and you see the increase in the Raman intensity, and then the Raman intensity stays the same, no matter how you scan around on the surface um, of your gold nanoparticle layer. And if you've worked in, um, in the systems for surface enhanced Raman scattering, normally they have very intense hotspots somewhere, but as soon as you move only half a micron away, all your intensity is lost. So having something that's very reproducible and very stable um, is also an advantage in itself. Uh, professor? Yeah. Uh, it's already been one hour since the beginning of your talk, so if you could wrap up in a few minutes. Oh, sorry. Um, you should have warned me. Okay, so then um, um, I asked and you said I have 20 minutes left. Okay. Um, so we, we've also looked at, um, at surface enhanced infrared absorption, but let me just at the very end um, sh show you something about the coupling um, of the molecules that sit inside um, these, that sit in the voids of these um, gold nanoparticle crystals. So we um, have the molecules in here and we ask ourselves, how strongly are these molecules um, going to be coupled to light? So will we have something like vibrational strong coupling or vibrational ultra strong coupling because we are able to kind of structure the electromagnetic field in these gold nanoparticle crystals in such a way. Um, and um, so um, what we did here is um, maybe I explain this experiment and then I say you uh, what the outcome of this, this question is. So what you see here is the infrared absorption of the gold nanoparticle crystals and these very broad um, absorption peaks um, are absorption peaks that again arise uh, from the plasma and polaritons. And then on top of that, you have weak features um, that comes from the absorption of the molecules. 
And now if I, uh, by changing the thickness of the uh, nanoparticle crystal, if I move the resonance of um, the gold crystal to the same frequency um, as the infrared absorption of the molecule, you can see that the absorption intensity increases very strongly. So this is surface enhanced infrared absorption. But then we started to calculate how large the coupling of these molecules um, is actually within the system. For that, uh, we used a model that was composed of three coupled um, oscillators. And if you do that, um, we found that the Rabi frequency for the coupling between the vibrational modes and the plasmons is on the order, the Rabi frequency is on the order of 100 wave numbers. Um, which means that we are kind of already close to the ultra strong coupling regime that will set on if we further increase this here by a factor of two. Interestingly enough, we are far away from strong coupling. Um, and the reason for that is that the losses of our plasmonic cavity is so high. Um, so what, what one could do is instead of just having um, the nanoparticle crystals, which are really a very poor cavity, uh, one could put a gold cavity at the top um, and the bottom of the crystal, and that would make um, the losses of the, um, um, the, the radiative losses of the gold um, cavity that's on the order of 900 wave numbers here would reduce it um, by a factor of five. And then we should actually be able to see the splitting and get the molecules here into the regime of strong coupling. And if we're able to increase the oscillator strength a bit further by either using different molecules or actually looking at a different uh, vibrational mode of the polystyrene molecule, we should also get ultra strong coupling, which means that this dip here will go down all the way to zero. Okay, so um, with that, let me briefly bring up my conclusion. So I wanted to show you that it's possible to really explore the extreme ranges of light matter coupling by using artificial crystals that are made out of gold nanoparticles. If you really pack them very densely, um, we can use this to, to look at the physics of this extreme regime of light matter coupling, but we can also use the crystals as hosts um, to put molecules um, into a very special electromagnetic environment. Um, and at the end, I want to point out that what we put um, into the theory to do all this is just the lattice of interacting dipoles. There was not very much really special um, about the plasmons in itself. So there should be really more materials uh, where you can take the excitons or even um, the dipoles of um, infrared vibrations uh, to construct materials with ultra strong and deep strong light matter coupling. Thank you for your uh, attention. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Um, now we can move off to the final questions or for your presentation. I, I actually have one, um, and it's regarding your nano, nano, uh, your plasmonic nanocrystals. So, yeah. do you think that they offer a prospect for to exit, to uh, to observe this um, Casimir effect, where you can collect virtual photons in the ground state? And if they do, they offer any advantage with the, uh, with respect to the more conventional nanostructures like micro cavities? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I think um, they should offer a way to see that. Um, namely, so, so there has been a proposal that if, if you have a system that's in the deep strong coupling regime, you can actually read it out with a three level system um, that is only weakly coupled to it. Yeah. So, and namely, essentially, um, what you can do is um, you, you, you have two, so you have three levels, they have different energies. Can, can you see me pointing? I can probably stop sharing. Yes. Okay. Um, so, you, so you would have two levels um, and um, if, if, if this, uh, this uh, environment around it um, consists of a system in the deep strong coupling regime, there would be lots of virtual excitations now um, uh, around the system. So what would happen is that for this two level system, not only the, the, the ground state is populated, but also the first excited um, state gets a finite population. 
And now imagine you have a third state and you can probe, you, you send in a photon that probes the transition between the second and the third state. Right. And normally if your system is not in an environment that's in the deep strong regime of light matter coupling, there would be absolutely no absorption because this state here is empty. However, because you populated, used the, the virtual photons, photon, so to speak, to, to, to populate, get a finite population in this state here, you should be able to get an absorption from level two to level three. Oh, okay, I see. Thank you. And, and actually we have uh, four more, more questions, uh, if you're willing to take them. Yeah, sure, yeah, I'm happy. So, go ahead, uh, Professor Gila. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, perhaps I missed the definition of these virtual photons. Can you explain what they are? Um, so this is, if you look at the, um, um, so, so if you write down the Hamiltonian of your system in such a way, and then look at the polaritons and ask yourself, how is the polaritonic ground state? How does the polaritonic ground state look like in terms of photons and plasmons? Um, and then you will find that when you get into the ultra strong and deep strong regime of light matter coupling, as soon as these counter rotating terms really become um, important, um, that you have a finite occupancy for the, for the photonic states and also for the meta states in the ground state of your system. And this is, people describe this as virtual excitations. Nice. Um, and say, well, I mean, then you get the, the typical language that they're created out of the quantum vacuum and, and so on. Okay, thanks. And the idea okay. is that, that there should be ways I mean, it's, it's allowed. So as long as it is a ground state of the system, of course, you cannot use these, I mean, the, these photons do not emerge from your material. Um, and then there were ideas of how to convert these virtual excitations into real excitations. And mostly they involve um, kind of um, very rapidly and very rapidly really means very, very fast switching off um, deep strong light matter coupling so that you get into the uncoupled state. And then these virtual excitations so, should convert into real photons that you can get out. Well, what's the advantage of that? Uh, sorry, Professor, did you hear the question? No, I don't hear anything right now. Yet now I heard you. Uh, uh, Professor Gilad asked, if, what is the advantage of doing that? Of doing what? Uh, getting the photons out or? Yeah, yeah making the virtual think, photons okay. into real photons. Of, uh, <laughs> 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 it's a typical thing that physicists love showing that, I mean, Strictly speaking, you can get entangled photons. So if you, if you do this process in a, in a way like a simulated emission, you could get pairs of entangled photons out of this, um, of this state. I see. Okay, thank you okay, very much. Now, yeah. Yeah, okay, so we have uh, uh, one, two more questions. Um, Bo, go ahead. Oh, hey, can you hear me? Hi, hi Professor. Um, I have one question regarding the uh, um, the nanostructure of this uh, plasmonic cavity. So um, do you think the plasmonic mode volume would be a key factor in this uh, deep strong coupling regime? Um... I mean, I, I think there is one way to get into the deep strong coupling regime by really having extremely small mode volumes. And there are some people who claim that, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have seen the work um, by, by Jeremy Baumberg, 
on these pico cavities where he puts uh, gold nanoparticles on on top of gold mirrors um, and then from time to time they get a very strong response and interpret it as a little gold protrusion that has formed because the gold atoms become mobile so that you would have a, a cavity um, that is on the order of picometers to the cube and if you're really able to focus light into such um, small cavities then you should I mean, it, it, it should be doable um, to get into the deep, strong regime also by just reducing the mode volume. Um, you can hear that I'm a bit uh, <laughs> trying to be careful in, in um, how I phrase this. Um, I haven't actually seen it to happen. I mean, what I'm, what I'm sure what works is use it, taking a very strong oscillator strength and um, many um, particles together, and um, then you are able to push into this deep, strong regime. Whether it's doable um, by reducing the mode volume and then eventually also doing it for a single system, I think future needs to show. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, we have one more question. Um, what, Hi. Yeah. Hi. 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 I have uh, questions about the last part of your talk. So um, the uh, vibrational coupling, that strong coupling that you show, does it couple to just the plasmonic tail of the infrared uh, plasma, or it, do you couple the vibration model to the vibrational uh, the plasma fluoride pump there? I, I didn't get that. Yes, it's uh, OK. Oops. I think I don't share my screen anymore, right? Uh -huh. um, so you can either describe it as a system of, of these three separate Lorentz oscillators, the, the photon, the collective plasmon, and the molecular vibrations. That's, that's one way of describing it. Or you can combine these two into one which is probably yeah. the a more proper way of doing it, and say, this is my polariton, and I couple the molecular vibration to the polaritonic system. I see. Um, so, so then the, the dips that you see in your, uh, in your uh, experimental measurement, those are your new um, polariton mode, or those are just vibrational absorption? Um, the polariton mode is, is, is this very broad feature here. Okay. And these dips on top, um, these are the absorptions by the polystyrene molecule that, that covers the nanoparticles. I see. Um, and what happens is, um, so, so, so you can look here at, at these, there's another set of vibrational modes at 1500 wave numbers, which doesn't get into resonance with the, with the polaritons due to the boundary conditions of the crystal. And you can see that here, no matter which crystal you look at, um, the absorption is always the same. So there is, it essentially corresponds to the absorption that you would expect for such a layer of polystyrene molecules. However, for the modes at 3000 wave numbers, we are able to push them into resonance with the polaritonic system. If they are not in resonance, their absorption is really weak. And then when they get into resonance, the absorption increases by a factor of, of eight to 10. And this comes from the, from the coupling between the molecular vibrations and the, and the plasma polaritons. I see, I see, I, okay, thank you. And we're not yet there, I mean, we're not, we're not at ultra strong coupling and we're not at strong coupling. The reason why we're not at strong coupling is that, that our cavity um, is really very lossy. You can see that the, um, that the cavity modes here have a huge half, half yeah. width at full maximum. Um, so we will never be able to see a splitting of the modes, et cetera, just because the polaritonic peak is so broad. Yeah, it has nothing to do with, uh, with uh, molecular vibrations. And what? therefore we said, okay, we could get this narrower by building now a cavity around our crystal. 
because then the plasmonic absorption as a polaritonic absorption will no longer look like this with a very um, high radiative damping, but it will become much narrower because we have gold mirrors on top and at the bottom. Right. So it changes, it changes the boundary condition and it makes uh, the lifetime much longer. And then if we do that, so this is still a, a calculation, a simulation, but for the same experimental conditions that we have right now, we should be able to see the splitting um, and mm -hmm. to have the system in the strong coupling regime. And we should also be able to get it into ultra strong coupling. Um, all we have to do for that is to increase the oscillator strength by a factor of three. And this is actually doable with the sets of mode down here because they have a, they have a, la a larger oscillator strength than the one we are using right now. Um, and it, these are mainly technical issues. We need crystals that are thicker um, in order for them. And in order to get thicker crystals, we need to use a different substrate. It's, it's kind of straightforward how to get there, uh, but we're not there yet. But um, I think then we would be able to get these uh, molecular vibrations also into the regime of ultra strong coupling. I see. What if you use water um, as your molecular vibrator? They have really strong um, oscillator strength. They also have a really broad um, lambis inhomogeneous and, and homogeneous lambis combined. So it's sort yeah. of matched with your broad plasmonic proton mode. So sorry, what did you suggest? I didn't, I didn't get it. I'm suggesting that instead of using polystyrene, can you use water as yeah. molecular vibrator to strongly couple to your uh, yeah. plasma florita? Um, I mean, the polystyrene was very handy because this is the ligand that's used to grow the gold nanoparticles. Oh. So it was, I mean, it came as a byproduct to the nanoparticle crystal. Um, we now started to attach additional molecules um, to the gold nanoparticles and that have a much higher oscillator strength and we are in the process of synthesizing um, these super crystals, these artificial super crystals with other ligands or other molecules, functional molecules on top. I see. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, now we have two final questions, Professor, if you are uh, willing to take them or? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. Okay. So I, have, I have all night. <laughs> I spent it at home with the kids, so I can stay here. <laughs> Hi. Um, I have a question from the very beginning of the talk. Yeah, uh, OK. So uh, when you have these gold nanoparticles and you arrange them into a crystal, and you look mm -hmm. at the plasma and resonances, mm -hmm. is the uh, magnitude and characteristics of these resonances similar to bulk plasmon resonances in like a piece of metal or surface plasmon resonances? Um, you mean the position of the resonance or? Yeah, position or general like properties, would it be similar to the bulk? So I mean the bulk plasmon um, in, in um, so, so, so the plasmon in bulk metal, you can never excite this light. It's just impossible. You cannot just shine light onto it, okay. um, and then and then see absorption by a plasmon. In in, in, in bulk metals, plasmons are only longitudinal excitations. The transverse um, solution has a frequency of zero, so it's 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 trivial. Okay. Um, and even with the surface plasmon, um, it is not. I mean, you have to play some tricks in order to excite the surface plasmon. It is not something where you just shine light onto a surface and then you get the propagating mode there. Whereas here for these super crystals, you just come with, um, you know, your flashlight or whatever you want to. Um, and, um, and, and you're able to see absorption and reflection um, that comes from the excitation of the plasmon polaritons. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, so finally, we have uh, one more question. Oh, hi, uh, again, uh, thanks for a very nice talk. I just want to follow up on the last part of your uh, seminar where you uh, were talking about using the enhanced electromagnetic fields to do spectroscopy. Yeah. So 
Uh, would you say that there are advantages of to that rather than to with the more uh, generic, like say dimer of plasmon dimer that you even showed, or yeah. the nanoparticle in a mirror type uh, arrangements compared yeah. to yours? It depends what you want to do. Um, I mean, if you want to get the highest enhancement and study, I don't know, interaction of uh, plasmonic cavities with single molecules and so on, then never, nothing is going to beat a particle on the mirror or, um, or carefully prepared dimers. But your last part where you talk about putting, like studying molecular vibration, uh, that one is single, single vibration, right? Single molecular vibration. It's a single molecular vibration, but many molecules. Um, but it is um, kind of, so I think for surface enhanced Raman scattering, really the advantage of these materials is um, that is, is, is shown here, that you can essentially um, go everywhere in the surface and you will get a very reproducible enhancement. With, I, with all other systems that we have for surface enhanced Raman scattering, I mean, there are sometimes titles like highly reproducible Raman enhancement factors. And then when you look at the data that are presented, highly reproducible means reproducible within one to two orders of magnitude. And um, why, why is your system more reproducible than theirs? Because there are so many hotspots and they are arranged in a very predictable and, and regular fashion. Whereas normally, if you have a single hotspot only, um, first you need to focus very well on, on this hotspot. I mean, we, we worked a lot with service enhanced Raman scattering in, in, uh, in dimers that we produced by electron beam lithography. And it's really a pain to, um, to focus um, and make sure that you have the maximum Raman intensity. And then when you move by 50 nanometers, your laser focus, which is much smaller than the resolution that you have in your optical experiment, the intensity already drops by a factor of 30. So it's really, it's, it's very sensitive. Yeah. So, but wait, but in, okay, can you go to the slide where you have like the, the hybridization between plasmon, photon and vibration? Yep. Yeah, so here, are you talking about a single molecular vibration or many, or an ensemble of vibrations in that hotspot? Um, I don't know what you mean by a single molecular vibration. Do you mean like, one molecule or? Yeah, one molecule or. Okay. Or, or um, no, this, this was for many, this was for many molecules. Okay. 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 That makes sense. Yeah. Thank you very much. But there is a comparison. So on the, on the slides that comes after that. So here is a comparison. Um, I, I think there is an advantage in, in these crystals. And this is the fact that um, light is no longer a plane wave in here. Um, so normally, if, if, if you have a, a cavity, say, then the electric field is, varies along the z-axis. But if you go along x, y, um, you assume a plane wave. So the, the electric field will be completely homogeneous. Whereas here in these gold nanoparticle crystals, the light is going to be focused into these cavities. Mm -hmm. And this gives you an additional enhancement to light matter coupling. So um, these, these um, two simulations here is one for the polystyrene molecule inside um, the crystal that is placed inside a cavity. And here's a simulation for exactly the same cavity and the same number of polystyrene molecules, but they are now concentrated as a film in the middle of the cavity. So here you have, um, uh, plane waves um, that are responsible for the light matter coupling. And here you have this structured electromagnetic field that come from the, from the gold nanoparticle crystal. And if you look at the splitting, you can see that it's four times higher here than here. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you kind of sculptured your electromagnetic field gives you an additional contribution to light matter interaction. Thank you very much. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wright, for your nice presentation. Now, thank you. I will move on to just uh, make a final announcement. <clears throat> All right. Um, 
well, as a final announcement, uh, next week we will host, um, well, first of all, thank you all for uh, your attendance today to the final regular webinar of the year. As a final announcement, next week we will, we will host a roundtable discussion around the long debated topic of ground state chemistry in the polarity regime. Please uh, be sure to register at the link shown here if you're interested to attend. Um, thank you. Uh, uh, Thank you all and thank you, Professor Wright, um, for accepting this invitation and, and see you next time. Yeah, actually, I, I, I have some questions I wanted to ask you. Would you have time yeah. for, for a discussion, maybe Luis and, and Joel? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. sure. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I mean, we can do it now or when after people left, I don't know. Um, sure, or, or I, I can send like a new uh, Zoom. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, that would be nice. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll send that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. See you. Bye.